right. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be. Thank you for joining us. Another episode of Catching Up with Jacob. Jacob, you're on the East Coast today. How are you? I'm in New York, and I am holding on to Jesus, waiting for him to get back. Amen. You know, it comes to a point where that's that's all we have. Who have oh, yeah. I in but you? And on earth, there's no one I desire, said the psalmist. Amen to that, Jacob. Uh, David Lister, you are not in New York. You're on the other uh, side. You're in the Philippines. Yeah, I'm past you a couple miles there uh, <laughs> in the Philippines, in Cebu, Philippines, in my my little apartment here. They're, they're not very big. So no, but anyway, it's, you know, it, it's it's tough over here on people, the average person. Inflation is killing people oh, everywhere. Man. Yeah. Yeah. So pray for the people, the Philippines, Thailand, where we go. All right. Good job. Thank you, David. And uh, Davey, how are you? Doing pretty good. Thanks. Good to be All here. All right. And you're you're back. You're in, well, let's say you're back home. You are home. And um, someone who's not home is Jay. Jay, you're on the East Coast. Uh, I guess same time as Jacob, but just further south. How you doing? I'm doing well. Coming live from Kingston, Jamaica. All right. Very good. Praise the Lord. We'll come back to you in a moment, Jay. Uh, just wanted to greet everyone and, and welcome in the name of the Lord, those who are watching live, those who will watch later, you're watching Catching Up, and it's our, our, our way of notifying everyone what's gone in the world from a biblical perspective and giving you the scriptures and what the scripture has to say about the world. You know, it's uh, we have to understand what's going on in the world through the lenses of scripture, what's going on in the world and what God has to say about it, because that's the most important person, what God has to say about it. We're on different platforms, including Rumble, Memorial TV. Uh, we're even on Twitter and Facebook and uh, and Rumble, of course, it lets us uh, have quite a bit of freedom at this point. And with all the censoring going on in the world, I would imagine that, um, you know, there's going to be slim pickings for a while. So hang on to the uh, platforms that actually allow you to do this. And uh, we thank the Lord for the ones who have done it and praise God for the ministry that the Lord has given us. Uh, Jacob, you're in uh, New York. You're going to be speaking this weekend in, in New York and Baltimore. Any announcements on that? Church of the Open Door tomorrow, Saturday at 7 p.m. Um, in East Greenwich Village on 3rd Avenue and 7th Street with Pastor Dave Rosetto. We shall be there with bells on tomorrow night. We'll be looking at Striking the Arrows. That's tomorrow, Striking the Arrows, tomorrow in New York. Sunday afternoon in Baltimore, 3.30 p.m., also at the Church of the Open Door in Baltimore, another Moriel affiliate. Be there with, with, with Brother Collins and with Jerry DiMatteo. We shall be there 3.30 in Baltimore. The following week, we are in the Los Angeles area at Christian Church of DeVore with Pastor Marco Quintana. Uh, I'll let Marco announce that one. And from there, we're on to Maui to Pastor Rob Finberg in Upcountry Christian Fellowship in Maui. And then on to Australia, New Zealand, New Zealand, Australia, and the Far East. But tomorrow in New York, Sunday in Baltimore. Look forward to seeing you if you're in the New York area or in the Washington, Baltimore area. Please come see us. Amen. Yeah, Jacob's going to be here next Sunday at Community Church of DeVore here in San Bernardino. So if you're in the area, L.A. area, come and join us. It'll be awesome. It'll be a blast to hanging out with Jacob. And uh, on a Sunday, on a Sunday afternoon, hanging out with Jacob. Actually, it's 1030, but uh, we usually have so much fun. We go into the afternoon and... Uh, then Jacob gets gets really tired. We get him really tired, and then he goes home. So <laughs> James, will be with me. James will be with me. He's going to drive me in from L.A. Amen. And Jay will be having a lot of fun with us. So that'd be a lot of fun, Jay, once you come back. So let me go to Jay real quick, and then we'll go to David. Uh, Jay, let us know what's going on. You're in Jamaica, and a lot of people praying for you. Obviously, we notified everyone, and I can see your background's not the same. Uh, let us know what's going on. So this Saturday at 11 a.m., uh, I guess it would be Eastern Standard Time, I will be doing a Christian conference, Believer's Conference, here in Kingston at the Altamont Hotel in Kingston. Uh, it's going to be three hours. It's going to have coffee and tea. And I'm going to do be, be doing a presentation on biblical identity in the last days, talking about the many different issues that are facing the Jamaican, but also the international church. And uh, being here for almost a week now, I can tell you that Jamaica, unlike the U.S., there are many people who know who Jesus is and know that he is the Lord. So um, 
this is going to be, a, I think, a great conference. I'm hoping for a good turnout, planning on 3040, but we'll see what the Lord does. Amen, Jay. Thank you so much. And uh, you'll be back, uh, I guess you'll be back this week coming up, right? Yeah, you're, you'll be back this week. So, yeah, so I think the 22nd or something like that, right? Yeah, so praise the Lord. Well, praise the Lord for you, brother, and you're taking the gospel to the streets, not just on video form, but now live in front of people, just like Jacob. We do a lot of videos here in Memorial TV and DeVore, and then we uh, we actually take it to the streets, take it to where people are. David, you took it to where the people are, but on the on, on Asia, not only Thailand, Japan, back to uh, Philippines, back to Thailand. Let us know what's going on there. Well, you know, we're really blessed. Uh, you know, like Scott Noble in Thailand, Scott is a pure missionary. I mean, you if you stay around him two minutes, he's going to be giving out tracts I, everywhere. He tries to evangelize everywhere, you know, and he's got his young son, Micah, out there helping him. It's really wonderful to be with him. And so we were in the prisons. Well, they're opening us, open up the prison doors for us to come in and preach the gospel. You know, so the men uh, that we go to, they they ask us, please come back, please come back. You know, not just, oh, thanks for coming, but really, please come back. So pray that God will open up more doors for us there to preach the gospel and teach, help them be free. And also uh, the Philippines. Uh, Got to meet with some local uh, believers here. Got to meet with a pastor and his wife uh, in a local church. It's always good to have a local church to try to work with. They're they're involved with some missions programs, uh, not not only to the Muslims, but to feeding programs and outreach right here in Cebu. So, you know, it's it's a good thing. So the gospel is going out and. Um, well, then Japan. Well, Japan is a is hard ground. It is very hard ground. But we went to a place, Kamamoto, uh you can correct me, Jay, that is where Christianity was killed in the 1600s. But we had a meeting there at the International Center sponsored by two ladies. Uh, please pray for their husbands, uh, Yoko and Yuno, and that... Uh, they would be saved. And so they sponsored us and they were so nice. And we had a decent crowd of pastors, some other people, but it's small in Japan, but we did hand out tracts. We did have hand out the book of Matthew that's been translated to in Japanese. So it's tough ground, but we want to go back and try to maybe plant a church there. Amen. Thank you, David. Thank you. Appreciate it so much. And uh, uh, praying for you so that um, when you come back, you let us know what else the Lord has done through you. Yeah. So we want to we want to continue to uh, let people know that, you know, as we make videos, we also go out to the mission field. And Jacob's been traveling around for quite some time now and uh, pretty busy. So keep him in prayer. Keep David in prayer. Keep Jay in prayer. And uh, and, and Jacob's going to be visiting with uh, New Zealand and Australia pretty soon. So I'll be hanging out with Davey uh in may yes that's gonna be awesome that's gonna be great rihanna we will see pierre we'll see rihanna and we'll see uh, mike keeney we'll see warwick thorpe we'll warwick see, yeah yes we'll see so many and marguerite of course we'll see so many of our friends hopefully sam the greek many of our friends in australia new zealand we haven't seen since before covid i'm looking forward to it Lori, uh, yeah that's right, other, Lori. yes i'm looking forward to it Amen. Well, that's going to be great. And so looking forward to it. So if you're watching from Australia, New Zealand, uh, get ready, buckle up. Jacob's coming. So that's going to be a lot of fun there and visiting different cities and um, preaching in different venues. So, um, you know, the Davey or Rihanna, right? Dave, right. What's the email address, Davey? Just email us, email us at uh, Moriel Australia dot um, at gmail dot com. Okay. And for New Zealand, Moriel NZ at gmail.com. Very good. Very good. Thank you so much, Davey. And uh, we're looking forward to that. I was there last year. So much fun. And uh, continue on the work that the Lord has given to us there in encouraging the believers, building them up. We're going to talk about Australia today. So uh, buckle up if, you, if you're in Australia, New Zealand, and uh, things that are going on there. But before we get started, we want to mention that we do have podcasts. So 
Make sure believers uh, can get a hold of those podcasts uh, on Buzzsprouts, but also on the Morial website, morial.org. There's all the links that you can find them there. So that's going to be awesome. So get a hold of that because there's all these different teachings, different ones that we do here on Catching Up. There's different ones from Sandy, from Jacob, from myself. And um, I think David has some too. And uh, we pray that it continues to bless you in the name of the Lord. All right. Well, let's catch up, guys. And uh, uh, Jacob, we, we spoke about a subject last week which uh, was on gay Christianity, gay celibate theology. Gay celibate theology is what they call it. And uh, we got some feedback, and praise God. Uh, people were thankful that we brought it up. People, Some people were unaware. Some people were aware. and uh, But I don't think the, they understand the gravity of it. So I wanted you to do, uh, uh, you know, you and I talked about off the air, uh, what you wanted to say about what's going on there, especially when it's getting into organizations and movements that you know quite well was the Calvary Chapel, friends with Chuck Smith and different pastors. Uh, but gay celibate theology is even um, getting into that organization, that uh, movement. And um, it's a really sad thing to say. I came out of Calvary Chapel as well. So, um, Jake, I'm going to turn it over to you. Did your hot take on it? Gay Christianity. I mean, really? Gay celibate theology? Uh, they celebrate a book by Greg Cole, and other people like Preston Sprinkle really promote the idea uh, that this is something that they need to look into. But I'll let you take on it, brother. And uh, I'll put the video, I'll put the uh, the book up so you people can see it. But uh, Jacob, go right ahead. Well, we've already addressed several times what transpired in the largest so-called evangelical denomination or movement in the United States, the Southern Baptist with J.D. Greer when he was president of the Baptist Convention, Southern Baptist saying that homosexuals um, should find their number one advocates for homosexual and lesbian rights should be born again Christians, should be Baptists. The Southern Baptists went straight down the sewer. Um, and so many Southern Baptists who knew it was wrong just went along with the agenda and didn't protest. They didn't overthrow him. They didn't do anything. People like Al Mohler basically sat on the fence. We just saw a complete erosion of what had been the Southern Baptist biblical standards of morality and 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 belief, doctrinal belief. Um, well, now this has happened to Calvary Chapel. We knew that if Chuck Smith had not appointed a Joshua, he said he followed the Moses principle. Well, one of the aspects of the Moses principle is Moses groomed a Joshua to take over for him before he went that would uphold the same teachings, the Torah. And Chuck Smith did not do that for whatever reasons the Moses principle was not followed, even though Calvary Chapel professed to believe in it. There was no Joshua to take Chuck Smith's place. As we predicted and others predicted, um, the Calvary Chapel movement fragmented between the global and the Calvary Baptist Association or whatever, um, Calvary Chapel Association. Um, and we're seeing it. All you can find are individual Calvary chapels and individual pastors who will uphold the traditional beliefs of Calvary Chapel under Chuck Smith, but there is a general compromise across the board in both the global branch of what had been the Calvary Chapel movement, following Brian Broderson out of Costa Mesa and the Calvary Chapel Association, who are now saying it's an issue we have to look at and individual churches can take their own doctrinal position. Well, a movement like that is fragmented. It is no longer a movement. It's maybe united by theocratic politics, but it is not united by the word of God or the spirit of God. We warned what was happening with this rather depressing figure, um, Preston Sprinkle in I Idaho, featuring this book by this Gregory Cole. Can we look at the book very briefly? Single gay Christian, which we say is a contradiction in terms, a contradiction in terms. When you're born again, the homosexual is dead. You are a new creation in Christ. The Bible speaks of the renewal of your mind. This is a fundamental denial of salvation as the Bible teaches it. Sanctification, justification followed by sanctification, the renewal of your mind. If there's no sanctification, there will be no redemption. Justification, Christ justifies us by paying for what we did. 
sanctification by his spirit, he changes us. He changes our soul, renews our minds, and redemption, lift up your head, your redemption draws near. If there is no sanctification following justification, there will be no redemption. This is a formula for an institutionalized backsliding. This man is anointed of the devil. He's a servant of Satan writing such a thing. No, you are not single gay and Christian. You are formerly gay the way I am a former cocaine addict or the way an alcoholic who gets saved is a former alcoholic. They're a new creation in Christ. What this denies is the power of new creation, the renewal of the mind. You become a new creation. No, I'm still gay, only I'm not practicing it. This man is a liar sent by the devil. He's a religious liar. But he's not the only culprit. When you have a Calvary pastor, like Mr. Sprinkle, handing him a platform and a microphone. This is bad to promote such a book, to give any kind of avenue to such an expression that is directly contrary to scripture. But there is yet another villain in the Calvary Chapel movement. Also in Iowa, his name is Tom Velasco. I don't know if we have a photo of him, but this is what he says. Mr. Velasco compares a homosexual having a same-sex attraction only and not acting on it to his sexual attraction to Audrey Hepburn or something like this, um, to a Hollywood film starlet. This is absurd. Unambiguously, the epistle to the Romans states the following. Verse 26, for this reason, God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural. It calls lesbianism unnatural. Verse 27, in the same way, also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire towards one another. The New Testament unambiguously and emphatically makes a distinction between a natural attraction and an unnatural attraction. You cannot equate the two in any sense. Well, I'm tempted to want to sexually fantasize about Audrey Hepburn. And then my fair lady, or what a breakfast at Tiffany's, or whatever it is, uh, and, and and try to equate that with someone having a same sex attraction. The scripture draws a distinction. Yes, lust is wrong in all categories, but the scripture does make a distinction between a natural attraction that generates lust and an unnatural one. Let us understand the Torah, the Pentateuch. No, we're not under the law, but the law does show God's standards of righteousness and holiness. The law is our tutor, our pedium, pointing us to Christ. We don't stone these people to death in the new covenant, but the sin is no less serious. Let's understand this. Fornication, an attraction to a movie star or, or attractive woman or attractive man, Fornication is sin, but it is not considered to have been a capital crime. Homosexuality in God's law, the Torah, is a capital crime. Now, am I saying that we're under the law of Moses and that we should stone these people? No, but the consequences of their sin on the day of judgment will be hell damning unless they repent. Both testaments, the old and the new, clearly draw a distinction between a lust that emanates from a natural attraction and a lust that emanates from an unnatural attraction. Tom Velasco is a religious liar from the devil. That man speaks from the enemy.
and he's given platform by Preston Sprinkle. These men are not of Christ. They are of the enemy. This is not the Calvary Chapel of Chuck Smith or of Paul Smith, both of whom I knew, and I knew rather well. This is not New Testament Christianity. This is compromise with the world and its perversion. And it's getting into the church. No, it has gotten into the church. And now Calvary chapels have compromised and sold out the same as the Southern Baptists. It is part of the apostasy of the last days that Jesus told us will come. Unless these men repent, may the Lord remove them from the ministry. May the Lord raise his hand against Velasco, against Cole, and against Sprinkle. They are enemies of Christ. They are deceivers. They are religious liars. They are false teachers. What they are saying and doing is fundamentally incompatible with the word of God. And it in no way, no way, were the beliefs of the founders of Calvary Chapel, of Chuck or Paul, no way. I think it is time for people like Joe Foch and so forth who are still in Calvary Chapel, if they have any semblance of what they once were, to stand up and say so. But instead I'm seeing compromise. People like Skip Heidzik, we have to look at this. What is there to look at? You have to throw it out and throw these people out. Now, when they didn't throw people out who they should have, they had a split, a predictable split with the Calvary Global Network. That was the result of compromising and not removing the cancers that they should have. Well, now the cancer has become metastatic. Hmm. Calvary chapels, if we know it, is over. It is one big carcinoma. Individual Calvary pastors need to get out of it. It's like any other, it's like the Church of England. Individual believers, individual pastors, individual congregations need to get out of it. Either you throw these people out, and if they don't throw them out, you should get out yourself. Don't stay in it, lest you participate in their sins and share in their plagues. Revelation 18.4. This is not a peripheral issue where we can agree to disagree. This is fundamental biblical morality. That is my take. Yeah, thank you, Jacob. Uh, Very good. And uh, I just want to let everybody know that that conference that uh, Mr. Sprinkle has, it's uh, this weekend. Uh, it started yesterday, I believe. It started yesterday and uh, through Saturday in Boise. And it is a Calvary Chapel Boise who uh, apparently they're not just renting the building from them. They're actually uh, pretty closely associated because he's been doing this. Uh, Sprinkle has this conference quite a bit and it's called Raw Theology. I think this year it's called Exiles in Babylon and they're tackling quite a bit of issues. And um, so, you know, we don't want anybody to take our word for it. Look at it yourself that they are going to be talking about this. They have a whole section on Gen Z, which is the generation that really young at this time. My kids are that age. And uh, Israel and politics and Palestine, which is basically uh, the issue that's going on, you know, taking the Palestinian side, taking the Israeli side. Then they're doing deconstruction and reconstruction of the gospel. That always gets me a little nervous, right? They, Jay, we did a whole section on deconstruction yes. and reconstruction. It, it is, and then the LGBT people in the church. That's one of the one of the sessions there, which I think, and, and maybe I'm wrong, but I believe it's it's right. They're going to have a, a a person who is a transgender speaking at that conference. So um, you can see where this is at. And this a is going. transgender so, speaking at the conference, the same as Andy Stanley. Yeah. This so, is my the, proposal. Mr. Cole, Mr. Sprinkle, and Mr. Velasco, I've publicly called you a religious liar and a deceiver sent from the devil, a false teacher. I've publicly stated that about you. Meet me on a platform on front of a live stream video camera and debate me. I will debate from the original Greek and Hebrew text. I will debate you on this issue directly from the original Greek and Hebrew text. I say you are a liar, you are a deceiver, you are a false teacher, and you do not re represent 
the traditional beliefs of the Calvary Chapel movement because you've departed from the teaching of the New Testament. You're a deceiver and a liar and a false teacher. Prove me wrong. Meet me on the platform of debate and a live stream. Let yeah, the body of Christ decide. I think Sprinkle, I think he has a PhD. I think he got it from, uh, I think it's Biola. I think he did get it from Biola. So he runs the Center of Faith or Sexuality and Gender. In that case, he ought to be good in Greek and Hebrew. Uh, I think anyone no, who got it out of the box of Fruit Loops himself, but... It must be the California Seminary thing. I don't know. I think it's Talbot. I think that's where he went to, to school to Talbot. But uh, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure. So this is this is the ones of promoting uh, Gregory Colin. Uh, I don't want people to go buy the book or anything like. We're not trying to promote the book, but in the book itself, it, it's got some really. I don't know where they get this from, Jacob. About you know, there's there's the pre-fall uh, genders, and then there's the after-fall gender. And who knows, maybe God made me like a eunuch in, in a pre-fall gender. But now after the fall, it, it, it you know, it went into immorality. But now maybe I could just be like a eunuch for God. And, and there's many people like that, he said. Maybe who knows? Who knows? God may have many genders. The Hebrew is clear. The word for sex is mean. It's translated the Greek word gene, genus like. It comes from it. Mean, of a kind. The biblical teaching about sexuality in the animal kingdom, zoologically and with humans, is always focused on the reproductive element of it. When Noah took the animals onto the ark, it was to replenish the animal population. There was a reproductive element in it. Adam and Eve, God's first command to man was go forth and multiply. For the divine perspective of sexuality to be understood, it must be understood in that we are imagio dei beings made in God's image and likeness. He is creative, so he made us procreative. If you take out the procreative element from human sexuality, you have a sexual model that is contrary to scripture, certainly alien from scripture. This whole thing is a lie of the devil, and the people saying it are liars of the devil. Debate me. Yeah, they call it a uh, uh, side A and side B theology, which side A is the, the the marriage gay affirming side of it all, which you know many Christians will oppose it. You know, but the, the side B one, it's the one that we're talking about, gay celibate theology, and that's a little bit more palatable. It seems like for a lot of people, they're swallowing it hook, line, and sinker because it it does deal with the sentimental side of it. Well, my my children or my aunt or my uncle, you know, they're gay, so maybe they could become Christians. Yeah, and this, still this this was invented by the religious liar. The first apologist for this was Tony Campola. Mm. With his, his his red and his his, his black letters, yeah. and uh, arguing relationally, truth becomes relational instead of doctrinal. No, right. God's truth is not relational; it is doctrinal. This first deception came with Tony Campola, whose son is a rank unbeliever, and now it's come into Calvary chapels. Yeah, it's devoid yeah. of any biblical merit or basis. Yeah, uh, Jacob, who did you say was the first one who that you saw that was changing the gospel from ju uh, judicial type language to more of a family relational type language and began to change the way the gospel Certainly was? Certainly, Brian McLaren would have been one of them. Okay, yeah, but taking the by the, the gospel out of the language of the courtroom and vineyard yes, people. That's it. taking oh, wow. the Bible out of the language of the courtroom and putting it into the family drawing room. John yeah. was that, was that Wimber? Okay, Wimber. Yeah. Well, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John put the gospel into the courtroom. It's a juridical proceeding. Jesus right. was put on trial and wrongly convicted for what we were guilty of. Jesus was put on trial for our sin. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, the word of God, the Holy Spirit ordained that the Bible be put in the language of the courtroom. These religious deceivers want to take it out of there. Only once you deal with the realities of the juridical conviction that we are guilty of sin and Christ had to take the blame for what we did. Only after you deal with the reality of sin and judgment, the Holy Spirit will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. Only when you come to terms with that through faith and repentance can you relate to God as a loving father, bringing 
the church into the family living room, parlor, salon. These men are deceivers sent by the devil. It is the apostasy of the last days. That is what they are. And now it is in Calvary Chapel, which does not frankly surprise me. When Chuck yeah. Smith went to his grave, Calvary Chapel went in the grave with him. Somebody get a shovel. Apparently, they, they've made that issue to the local churches, even among CCAs. It's just, it's a local church issue. So, you know, praying, praying that these pastors will get some uh, some courage to stand up against it. And there are some pastors that would do it, but uh, I, I don't know where the majority stand. I don't if they know had any they... courage, they would have done it already. Yeah. yeah. All right. Very good. Thank you, Jacob. And uh, like I said, for those who, um, you know, don't want to take our word for it, just go. Uh, faith, uh, I think the Center of Faith and Gender uh sprinkles has a conference this weekend in boise and obviously uh, tom velasco is one of the pastors there so uh jacob let's move to another subject here which is today is the 29th anniversary 29th anniversary of the oklahoma city bombing which happens to be also the 25th anniversary uh, sorry that's 31 no yeah 2029 the 31st anniversary of the waco shooting what happened in waco with david Koresh and the branch davidian uh, there in um, in Waco, Texas. Uh, you, I remember listening to you quite quite a long time ago about what happened in the with Waco and Branch Davidian and David Koresh. And it is interesting that it is today, and it's exactly what happened at the Oklahoma City bombing because the the, the Timothy McVeigh said that this was uh, planned at the Oklahoma City. A federal building, and that's why he bombed it to as a basically a revenge factor of it. But it's interesting that it was the federal government who acted against the church, albeit a cult. Uh, yeah. Jacob, I remember listening to you about it. You broke it down so well. Don't have to relive the message and do it. We don't have the time for that. But can, can you let us know in, in, in what happened in 30, 20, okay. 31 years? 31 years now. There's the legal aspect, and then there is the spiritual or doctrinal or religious aspect, if you will. Let us take the legal aspect first. Janet Reno, whether she was a lesbian or not, I don't know. I just know she was a horrible woman, as it, it is alleged she was. She was a horrible woman, uh, Clinton's attorney general, eminently unqualified for the job, later tried to run for Senate in Florida, didn't succeed, fortunately. Now she's dead. Okay, this is Janet Reno. She completely, completely running the Justice Department did nothing. She failed in her mission concerning Chinese spies and the Clinton administration giving nuclear missile, I'm sorry, uh, missile guidance technology to China. And there was Chinese espionage active in that sphere at the time. She was a failure, a complete failure as a attorney general. She was a politically appointed because she was a woman, et cetera. She was a complete and total failure. This should have been a state issue. If the Texas Rangers had been allowed management of that situation, it would not have ended as badly as it did, in my opinion. It is likely it would have ended differently. They would have arrested Cordish off the grounds and got him away from the people. But the ATF and the FBI got involved. The federal government took over what should have been something mandated constitutionally to the states. You can always find some federal statute or regulation to involve the federal government with its political motive to do so. That's one of the problems with the FBI and the Justice Department. The ATF is, of course, the Treasury Department, which is no better. It didn't have to happen the way it did. It should have been handled by the state, by the Texas Rangers. It would not have been as gross as it was. Now let's look at what happened with Koresh. The slippery slope. A pastor in upstate New York gave me 129 pages of testimony of people who had been in the Branch Davidian sect and I read these documents he gave me, 129 pages of people who'd been in it. And it was unbelievable what this guy was saying. 
He had 13 hour Bible studies every day. They were always 13 hours, almost yeah. precisely, always on the book of Revelation. And it was preparing people for this apocalyptic event where they were brainwashed into thinking their salvation was through their association with him. They'd been so brainwashed that when they shot it out with the FBI, they thought that that was this apocalyptic event. Mm. That appears to be what happened. Well, it, it is what happened. Um, he was crazy. He was also sexually perverted and an unbelievable, unbelievably sexually perverted. He was the only spiritual man, so only he had relations with women. Wow. Parents were giving their underage daughters over to him sexually. He had the women in a board wall like his own harem when the men were upstairs without their wives, sexually estranged from their wives, romantically estranged from their wives, semi-separated from their families upstairs in a military barracks type environment. He was down in the board wall doing what he wanted. And it involved abuse of children beating, abuse with women, and sadomasochism carried out in the name of religion, very much like what you find in convents and monasteries, the Roman Catholic type thing, the, the religious s &M thing of, 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 of Roman Catholicism, that kind of sick stuff. You're beating the mother in front of the kids, you see what happens to bad mommies and all this stuff. This, this is what they were doing, he was doing. I couldn't believe that people would follow him and believe him and do what he was saying. He had these crazy dietary laws that he was always changing. Now you can eat this, then you can't eat that. He had his own version of kosher or kashrut. And I'm reading and reading. A high percentage of his followers were black people. Not all of them, but a high percentage. Disproportionately a high amount were black. And a very high percentage, about 30% were from Great Britain, from England. And I was trying to work out why it was, and I'm reading and reading 129 pages that this pastor gave me in upstate New York. And I'm reading and I'm trying to figure this out, and then I get to it. Every single one of them had been a Seventh-day Adventist. The oldest trick in the book, before Satan tried to Judaize the church, uh, paganize the church, he tried to Judaize it, getting people to live under two covenants. Now, I'm not talking about Jewish believers voluntarily keeping kosher or something like that. He made it mandatory. He was putting people under the law of Seventh-day Adventist style, trying to live under two covenants. Once you fall into one fundamental error, you become automatically predisposed to another fundamental error, and then another that is more serious progressively. You are on the slippery slope. I saw this in, in the Children of God cult. I saw this in the so-called Church of Bible Understanding, the Forever Family with Stuart Trail. You go into one fundamental error and you become predisposed to another one that's more serious you embark on the slippery slope. That's what he did. Seventh day Adventism paid was the was the prep school for the Branch Davidian cult. The oldest trick in the book, the book of Galatians tells us, trying to live under two covenants simultaneously. I'm not talking about voluntary Jewish observance to Jewish believers and their families. I'm talking about putting people back under the law, trying to live under two covenants. That is how this came about. He was obviously demon-possessed. He was demon-possessed. He was satanically empowered to exercise the kind of control he did. But the way he was able to manipulate people. We need to understand how satanic power in an individual can sway people. Adolf Hitler and his henchmen were demon-possessed. They swayed a nation a nation with a high standard of science and culture. How did he do it? He did it by demonic power. 
Ultimately, the Antichrist will do this, not by demonic power, but by satanic power. The worst is yet to come. Kodesh, which was not his real name, is just a little hint of the spirit of Antichrist that's being unleashed. Hitler is a better example in certain respects. But that's what it comes from. That's what it is. That's how we need to understand it. Very good, Jacob. Thank you so much. And that's been 31 years. Can you imagine that? 31 years, 29 I years. Remember since well. yeah. I remember it well. I remember Jim Jones in Guyana. Oh, do you? Okay. Yeah. Um, it was live, that's, that's, man. Yeah. Go ahead, David. Yeah, it was CNN covered the burning of the building live. Yeah, in yeah. Waco. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, it ended up being 80, I think more than 80 people uh, died. It was horrible. It was absolutely horrible. I don't know what the government did, but what David Koresh did in the Vidian branch. Also, tomorrow, it will be the 25th anniversary of the Columbine shooting, uh, which it was, uh, of course, the two the two boys, who, uh, two young men, Harris and uh, Claybold, who killed 13 people, including targeting Christians, targeting Christians uh, like Cassie Bernal and, and, and um, was one of the ones killed for her faith. So lots of stuff going on this, um, you know, all sort of uh, combined together in the same weekend. And um, it's always a strange coincidence, isn't it? But uh, obviously, the uh, bombing of the Oklahoma City building and the um, and the Waco uh, were related because they, they said it. Timothy McVeigh said that this was because they they organized it and that he came against the federal government for what they did to the people there. So very, very interesting. You know, now, yeah. yeah, what you see the mainstream media does and what the corrupt government does is this: they take a McVeigh. And they try to say, you see, right-wing extremists are as dangerous yeah. as Muslims. That's right. McVeigh was a one-off. The San Bernardino murders, the, the September 11th, the London 2 bombings, all the, the, the bombings in Munich and in Brussels and Paris. <laughs> McVeigh was a one-off. You have these transgender people and homosexuals and lesbians committing mass shootings. Yeah, it's this is what it's led to. That, and they course. suppress that. They suppress yeah. that. But if somebody they can pin as a Trump supporter or right wing or something does it, these people are in danger. Yep. They take yep. that crazy demoniac in Pittsburgh and they say this is common. This is this is the real threat. Yeah. They amplify these individuals who are evil people who need to be capitally executed or whatever, they take these people and they try to make them appear to be the main threat to cover up the threat that's coming from other, other social categories, radical homosexuality and radical Islam. That's the media's game. That's the corrupt government's game. You know, ahead, Marco, Jake. you've got... Christian, real Christians are becoming a very small minority, those that are standing for the truth. And so you have these others, the left wing and the Islam and all this, they're growing inside. So the pe the police are fearful of the mobs. Yes. So they arrest the weakened Christian. And so it becomes easy to yeah. stymie yeah. The, the, the police. But, I, you know, can I say something about that young lady? I remember that young lady, what she said. I guess the guy, Claybo, put a gun to her and said, do you believe in Jesus? And she said, yeah. He said, well, you're getting ready to meet him. And then she killed her. So what a good faith that she had, you know? So may we have it. But but can I ask something of Jacob, Marco? Would you mind? Yes. Yeah, yeah, please. We have, we have Christian nationalism is rising now. We have dominionism, seven mountains theology, all of this. And this is being viewed as something good. But how, Jacob, how does Christian nationalism line up with true belief in Jesus Christ? And, and is it going to be a threat to Christianity and distracting people that want to save America and things like that? First of all, what the mainstream media are doing are taking people who subscribe to traditional Judeo-Christian moral and family values and who are patriotic, believe in protecting the borders, things of that nature. They're taking those people and they are rebrandishing them or rebranding them 
as dangerous fanatics, potential terrorists. They're lying. They're only patriots. They are only people who have traditional moral and family values based on scriptural beliefs. The fabric that used to hold society together upon which the national identity was sociologically and politically predicated to a large degree. And they're taking them and remolding them in, in the public image as being the danger and the threat in order to downplay, to obfuscate what's really happening with Muslims taking over the and pro radicals the supportive of radical Islam taking over the Golden Gate Bridge. They want to dissuade from that by taking innocent people and calling them something they're not. Thank the you. numbers of right-wing fanatics who claim to be Christians and things of this nature, they're very they're odd individuals. They're odd individuals. But what the media and government are saying is. No, it's radical Muslims are the odd individuals. Most Muslims are good. It's the Christians who are the radicals. This is the hand of the devil. It is Satan. Do you think Christian nationalism and stuff is, is also an assault on true Christianity? The scripture calls Christians to be good citizens and to be salt and light in the society by upholding God's values and to pray for those in government and in leadership and have that influence. They are going to be attacked for doing that. Now, I do think when you have Reconstructionists, the people who follow the erroneous teachings of Ramshit Vazduni, people like uh, Greg Bonson and, and the late Gary North and, and, and David Shilton and the D. James Kennedy, people like that, I believe, had no biblical mandate to do what they were doing. Dominion theology, Reconstructionism, Jesus' kingdom is not of this world. But Christians being salt and light in the society and voting for candidates who uphold biblical standards, I think that is the right thing to do, but they're being called a radical threat to society, while the real radical threat to society are being protected by the media and by the corrupt government the administration, and the courts. All right. Very good. Uh, Jacob, let's talk about what happened in Wakely, Australia. And in the light of being, you know, Christians being attacked, and obviously this was a, an Orthodox priest that was stabbed, Marie Emmanuel, in Wakely, which is a suburb of Sydney. And he was stabbed by a Muslim, um, I think 15, 16 years old. I forget the age that he actually was uh uh, at the time, I think it was 15, but he stabbed uh, uh, Mari Emanuel, he stabbed another person, and he attacked the churchgoers. No one was killed, but then there was a, um, obviously there was a protest by the people that, you know, love the church or on behalf of the priest and did not like what this Muslim guy did, and so they began to protest, and immediately the police, of course, they try to squelch down what happened, and uh, immediately you see the government go completely into censorship. You can't yeah. find a video anymore. You can't talk about it yeah. anymore. They'll come after you. Now, granted, this is right after the mass stabbing in Bondi Junction, the shopping center, by another man who went on a rampage like that. So yes. what's going on in Australia, specifically attacking churches? Allowing radical Muslims into Australia or allowing Muslims into Australia without screening them for being radical is a gift to Australia from Penny Wong and the Albanese government. That is the opinion of many Australians who I know. And I, 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 I can see why they think that way. When your government will not protect you from alien invaders who are against your democratic values and freedom of speech and freedom of religion, people want to protect themselves. Yet the government, and the police are pressured to criminalize the people trying to protect themselves because they do not want to do what is necessary. As we speak, Penny Wong is trying to bring more radicals, more radical Muslims into Australia from Gaza. She's trying to import more of them. Now, if I was an Australian, I would call this betrayal. I would see this as a treasonous act if I was an Australian citizen. I see the same things in America and other countries. I saw how the 
lying filth that came out of the mouth of George Bush after September 11th, trying to defend Islam. They're our friends, and Saudi Arabia are our friends. When they're arresting and beheading Christians, Bush saying our, Bush was a, a, a godless liar, a godless liar who many Christians voted for. He was a godless liar. That was America. Well, Australians have their own version of it. It's the same thing. You had the Australians coming back in body bags from Bali in Australia, murdered by Muslims. You had the riots in Quinola. You had another Muslim shooting people up down by Circular Key. You had these other attacks. And this kid is on the ground. This young guy is laughing after stabbing a clergyman who only exercised freedom of religion and freedom of speech. And now the government is anxious to protect who? <laughs> Itself? And you have an Islamic organization saying, report anybody speaking evil about Islam and about Muhammad the prophet, and we'll take the necessary action. What's the necessary action? More murder? I'm asking the question, not making the accusation. The left-wing governments of Australia in its states, particularly New South Wales and Victoria, and certainly the present government of Albanese. We know that they will not protect the democratic freedom of Australian citizens. Those films should be posted on the internet because they show exactly what that guy did and why he did it. People have a right to see the truth. That's right. We do not say that there are not moderate Muslims. There are even moderate Muslim sects, like the Ahmadis. But remember, there are three times as many wars and armed conflicts in the world involving Islam then there are all the religious people groups in the world put together. They want to blame Israel. This incident had nothing to do with Israel. <laughs> the leader of Hamas in Qatar said, after we get rid of the Zionists, we'll kill the other Jews, and then we're going to kill the Christians. Yep. They say this openly, but the, the filth class, the political establishment, in the Western democracies that are not democracies anymore, will sweep this under the rug and defend this at the expense of not protecting their own citizens. This is what happened in the United States. It's what happens in Great Britain. It's what is happening in Australia. It is what is happening in many places. There is no place for moderate Muslims not to be protected from radical ones. Yet, moderate Muslims are in fear and hiding from radical ones. Ahmadi Muslims in the Muslim world live in fear of their lives. And again, I don't believe in Islam, but I believe in the human rights of moderate Muslims. The left will say nothing about the treatment of women and homosexuals in Muslim countries. They'll take the side of the very Islamic radicalism that commits these atrocities against women and homosexuals and whatever. This is the hypocrisy of the left and of the mainstream media. And Australia is a big example of it. Now, you do have certain journalists in Australia, like Andrew Bolt, who seek to tell the truth. I do admit that. And you have Melanie Phillips in England. I do admit that. And you have Newsmax and things like this in the United States. I do admit that. But the mainstream political establishment and the mainstream media are liars. They will protect the wicked at the expense of the innocent. They will betray their own citizens to foreign invaders, heathen savages with a murdering mentality. That is what they're doing. Yeah. That's what you see happening in London. It's what you see happening in New York, Washington, and San Francisco. And it's what you see happening in Sydney.
And it's ramping up. I'm going to go to Davey real quick. Davey, uh, what's your take on it? It looks like the, the tyrants uh, never let a crisis go to waste. Immediately, <laughs> the you know, was it was her name Julie Grant, the e-safety? E and uh, I didn't yeah. know they even had an e-safety commissioner, but they do. Not letting anybody have any comments except what the mainstream, uh, not even mainstream media, what the government wants you to know. But uh, what's going on there? You're, you're there on the ground floor. Uh, tell us a little bit more. Yep. Uh, look, they've been using the events of the past week to really just ramp up uh, censorship, total control of everything on media platforms, what you can say, what you can do. Um, censorship kind of galore. That Julie Grant, she's a WEF, WEF plant, basically. So, oh, uh, man. <laughs> and oh, there's, a reason, yeah, there's a reason why Musk got rid of her from Twitter. Um oh. But the, the censorship has just been totally crazy. Uh, one, one attack you probably uh, wouldn't have heard of, most people here, even in Australia, probably haven't even heard of, is what happened in the Melton shopping centre where because it was Muslim against Muslim. So mm. uh, you had one Muslim with a machete, one with a knife, and they were going at it in a shopping centre oh, in man. Melton. So that was... <laughs> okay, it doesn't fit the narrative. You've got to sweep that under the rug. But... Look, lawsuits should really happen at the stabbing in um, Sydney. Uh, the media was quick to demonise uh, Benjamin Cohen, uh, made his life yeah, basically a living nightmare by falsely accusing him. Uh, they were quick to pin it, pin it on a, someone who was, you know, Jewish. But they had no problems yeah. doing that. No apologies, um, nothing like that coming forward. Uh, the censorship that's just going on at the moment is crazy. The filming, even of the protests that happened outside of the yeah, church, the whole film were, crew were deliberately staged, and the camera angles and every everything were deliberately done. It was it was basically a setup to make it look worse than what it actually was. Um, police going around to arrest uh, the believers. The guy surrendered, the guy gave himself up peacefully, you know, but they've got to make it all dramatic and have. Yeah. Look, they, they, they're gunning for they're gunning for Jews. They're gunning for Christians. We're the ones targeting all this talk about hate speech. Not one charge was laid against any of the ones who were screaming deaf to Jews from the Sydney mm. Opera, Opera House or other um, pro-Palestinian protesters where they're allowed to trash and destroy property and... Um, chant anti-Semitic uh, threats at the top of their voice, uh, threats of violence. Apparently it's um, it's okay to, you know, the hypocrisy is just astounding. Um, I am actually ashamed to call myself an Australian. I, I really am. It's disgusting. Uh, but this is what's happening. We're going to be controlled more and more. They're going to use this, mm. ram it through, with, along with the digital ID and the... Yeah the MyGov health passport and all the rest of it, they're saying that the digital ID is going to be voluntary, but it'll be voluntary <laughs> like most of the other things they've done. You're not going yeah. to be able to function unless you go along with it. Yeah, it's moving really fast. And this is what's going on with Christians all over the world. They're being treated like this. Churches are burning. They're being targeted. Christians are being targeted. They're being targeted for prison. They're being targeted for, you know, obviously physically. Uh, Rob Reiner released that movie. You know, of course, he he blames Christians for the problems in the world. It's called God and Country, which is a horrible film. Uh, Christians are a threat to democracy, he says, because they stand in the way as a roadblock to obviously the left wing agenda. So, uh, Jacob, in the UK, you got this this man who actually filmed what happened. The police came in, a psychiatric nurse came in to his home because he had posted as an Orthodox, uh, uh, I guess, Orthodox Christian. He says he goes to his priest and visits him in the light of what happened in Australia and the police show up and say, Hey, why did you post yes. that? You know, what are you doing? This is in the UK, which is known for targeting Christians on social media. Of course. They will let Muslims get away with the most atrocious of hate crimes and go after Christians because Christians don't riot. Mm. Mm. He said, "This is this is religious discrimination." He says, "The man that, that that led them into their home, into his home, you won't be knocking at a Muslim's door." So this is religious discrimination. Of course, He's absolutely right. 
Yeah. Now, this is the same police who targeted the lady praying across the street uh, from an abortion clinic in her mind. The same police who uh, indicted, basically went after the Christian preacher and the same police who even uh, took the uh, British Army veteran for posting that he didn't agree with LGBT. They literally show up to your house. Yes. <laughs> this is crazy. You know, these these police are, again, they're controlled by politicians who are turning them into a political police force. Mm. It is becoming very difficult to be a Christian in the British police or the Australian police or particularly mm. federal law enforcement because you have to wear a SWAT sticker. You have to reject the cross in favor of a SWAT sticker. You have to reject the Star of David in favor of a SWAT sticker. What's worse is the left-wing Jews like Reiner who, who support this agenda. Yeah, it's uh, unbelievable. Uh, uh, you talked about Rob Reiner before here. Uh, yeah. He's going after Christians. Well, with he's always stuff. been a parasite who made his talentless nothing who made it on his father's name and reputation. That's him. Okay, and uh, like all has-beens, Hollywood has-beens, he goes into left-wing political activism in order to try to keep his name in the paper or his face on TV to keep himself in the public eye because he doesn't have the talent or or the wherewithal to do anything without his, his father. Um, Norman Lear gave him a job because of who his father was. That is my opinion. He's talentless. But he, he does this, the whole, you know, uh, uh, Bianca Jagger type thing. The same thing. The, the Loretta, Loretta Swift type thing. The has-beens play Hollywood has-beens. They go into left-wing political causes to keep their faces in the public eye because they're no longer making it at the box office or on TV. That's what Reiner is, a parasite. But that is one aspect. The other aspect is... He's too stupid to realize that he is supporting an anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish agenda. At least Alan Dershowitz is waking up and realizing he doesn't want to be Alan Jerkowitz. He's realizing the truth of the Democratic Party establishment. Alan Dershowitz at least has the mental wherewithal to realize it the intellectual prowess to come to terms with it and the personal courage to confront it. Reiner has none of those things. You know, Jacob, I, you were call, we were calling out law enforcement and everything acting like Nazis. And before you even said that, I was thinking of police as they're just doing their job. I was remembering what come out of the Nuremberg trials. Yeah. I yeah. was just doing my job holding orders that's right and they're conditioning people to do this from political pressure from on top to comply and they've got families to feed but they get conditioned don't they they just keep yes. doing it you just go around i'll follow i'm following orders i'm just doing my job and they yep. end up becoming something else not yep. the, the, the it's not both yeah, they, you saw it during the lockdowns, right, David? You saw it during the lockdowns. They would come, they would break up a church meeting, they would break up, you know, try to imprison pastors in Canada and the UK. And they were just saying, like, look, I'm just here doing my job and just doing my job, just following orders. Yeah, yep. but Trudeau turned the turned the did everything he could to turn the the, the Mounties into a Gestapo. Mm. Yeah, their, yeah. Their, their eyes are being shut to what you know, like because most cops I've ever known and everything, they want to go in to keep law and order. They actually have a calling, you know, it's something else. The Bible talks about an anointing on his, uh, the civil servant, you know, but they're, they're losing it. Jacob, it's a, is, is it an infection of our society because we're going away from Look at the what's truth. happening? More and more cops are taking early retirement or they're quitting. Yeah. People yeah, are not wanting to take those jobs. There's shortages of police officers throughout the United States alone, because honest cops can't be honest cops. You have to be a crooked cop to be a cop these days in some of these jurisdictions. Yeah. And honest cops want to be honest. Yeah. We don't mean making money or anything, but just not doing what is right. Not doing what is right. That's Yeah, right. but I mean, if, if it's your income and your job security and your pension, you're doing it for money. Yeah, fair, fair enough. 
yeah, I wasn't absolutely. thinking that way. When I think of bad cops, I always, uh, you know, the French connection, that sort of yeah. stuff. <laughs> All right. Let's just talk about what happened yesterday in light of what happened last weekend, which is we got off the air and uh, Israel announced that they were going to, you know, the, they were going to hit, hit back and it happened. And um, because Iran uh, did it over the weekend, this past weekend, Iran launched uh I don't know, I ended up being 300 or 400, 500 missiles, drone attacks, and uh, into different parts of Israel. The uh, Some of the Arab states were able to take them down, along with the U.S. and uh, Jordan, the UAE, and Saudi Arabia. And uh, then the Israelis uh, basically strike back yesterday into Iraq, Syria, and Iran. Of course, the targets and the bases in which the drones and the missiles came out of. So... Uh, the weirdest part about all this, and we'll start with Jacob, is that Iran signaled that they were going to do it, and apparently Israel signaled that yesterday, uh, before before it happened, that they were going to do it. So this was on the on the Channel 14 TV of Israel. So uh, very bizarre to me that Iran would have given like 48 hour notice. Uh, but Jacob, I'll turn it over to you. Iranian media is confirming that did get attacked. The bases well, got attacked. This whole thing and, is um, ridiculous, corrupt political theater. The Chinese Communist Party has a hand in it. Absolutely. But at the center of it is the corrupt Biden or Joe Obama administration. Iran, through third parties, particularly Erdogan's Turkey, and possibly some other Muslim countries, but certainly Turkey, notified the Americans and hence the Israelis about what was going to happen. It was all pre-stage what they would do, the Americans, yeah. the British, the Israelis, and some of the Sunni Muslim countries, particularly Jordan, but also Saudi Arabia and some of the Emirates, were ready for it and prevented anything from happening because they were tipped off ahead of time. The right. Iranians knew if they just did it hostily without getting a green light from the powers that be, from the globalists, that Israelis would hit back and what would happen. Biden is out to protect Iran, not to protect Israel, not to protect America. He's out to protect Iran. And he knew if the Israelis had nothing to lose, they would hit back. And in an election year, he'd be vulnerable. Secondly, when the Israelis hit back, you had Cameron and you had Biden saying, we don't support Israel hitting back. Count it as a win. You weren't hit. You weren't hurt much. Just let it go. You're not allowed to shoot back. Again, Biden funded this. The money came from Biden and from China. Thanks right. to Biden because of the uh, not enforcing oil sanctions. So China was able to fund it thanks to Biden, and Biden funded it by unfreezing assets, as Obama did earlier. It's the Obama-Biden access. It was all staged. They funded it. Then they negotiated with Netanyahu. Look, I'm going to go into Rafa, which Biden didn't, Biden didn't want him to do. Well, we got to give them something. Let's say nothing when they go into Rafa. Oh, we'll only hit a couple of limited targets inside Iran so we can say we hit back and save face. But don't go in there and do what needs to be done. Um, Obama tied their oh, Joe Obama tied their hands. It is all corrupt. Biden, Obama are no friends of Israel. They are basically de facto sponsors of Iran. And I say that not to shock people, but because it's the truth. They unfroze the funds and gave it to them. They tied the hands of the Israelis in dealing with Iran. They let them go on with their development of nuclear weapons. This week, Reuters said that Iran may only be weeks away from developing a nuclear arsenal paid for courtesy of Joe Obama. Yeah, they kicked all the inspectors out too, so they wouldn't let them let them see it. Of uh, Jacob, do you think this is obviously the US is involved 
to a certain degree, but if it continues, would you would you think there'll be a the U.S. will be drawn into this conflict a lot more than where it is today? They're trying to do what they're doing, playing both sides to prevent the right. conflict from expanding more than it is. But ultimately, read Daniel ten; they're not going to be able to do it. That's the kick. Prayer. Right My hope is that the Almighty raises his hand against Obama. I want to see God Almighty destroy Barack Obama and Joe Biden because they will destroy America if God does not destroy them. I will curse them that curse thee. They will bring God's judgment on America. I pray to God that he raises his hand against Cameron, against Obama, and against Susan Rice, and against Lincoln, and against Austin, and against Jake Sullivan, and against Biden. Um, yeah, go ahead, David. Yeah, um, I I saw a report. I thought I saw it this morning. It might have been yesterday, but there was big nine one one outages across the nation. Okay, and the FBI said that China is ready to attack uh, America's infrastructure. So yeah. we're seeing a lot of these things happening and, you know, hopefully uh, Christians are seeing the same thing too and preparing for what if your electricity goes off? What if your phones go down? What if, um, you know, are you ready for a week or two weeks or whatever it's going to take? You know, it's uh, because it, it, it's, remember, it's death by a thousand cuts. Tack us yeah. here. I, I, I read something from, I think it was in the Epic Times from one of the CCP, uh, ex-CPC, uh, that uh, getting information from inside the party that um, that they've said, as long as they don't attack the Defense Department or the military, nothing happens. Hmm. That I thought that was an interesting statement. They can attack our infrastructure. They can attack everything else. But they don't care as long as you keep the missiles firing and all that stuff. They're, uh, it's, we're under attack, man. It, it was interesting, to your point, David, the uh, um, Congress knows that the, the issues that are going on with the CCP and the infrastructure attack, even Christopher Ray, you know, before Congress, hey, we are expecting an infrastructure attack, a cyber attack. Uh, by China, by the CCP. Even people that were part of the CCP who are more like whistleblowers now at the CCP says, you know who's funding this war? And, and, and to Jacob's point, the CCP yeah. has a lot to do with this. And it's not only Iran, but the proxies of Iran, including cybersecurity attacks, which yes. will be the, the proxies of China through uh, uh, through these hackers. So um, all in all, it's, we live in a very, very precarious situation. Now let's talk about the economic side of it. Futures tumble. Oil sores, gold sores. Um, I guess you said the yield, it's it's going down. Uh, Bitcoin's yeah, yeah. going down. People are very concerned of what's going to happen next, especially with the Natanz nuclear facility, which Israel may be targeting next. Um, Jacob, the future trading here, they talk about the economic okay. side of it. People are very scared going into the, we're already okay. in the election cycle, not going into, we're already in the election cycle. And this is not good for... Either party, you know, we want to kind of call no. the unit not good for any of the parties. As you know, I'm an independent. I'm not a Republican. I'm an independent. I think that people who think the Republican Party represent Judeo-Christian values or traditional American constitutional conservatism, I think they're very naive. You can talk about individual Republicans like Ted Cruz or Ron Paul, who may be like that, but you cannot speak of the Republican Party as being anything like what these naive people imagine. But what kind of a moron, what kind of a moron would believe the border is being protected? And listen to my orcas, that the border is being, you have to be a moron to believe it. You've got these cities being overrun by illegal aliens, cutting municipal budgets, cutting police and fire departments to fund illegal aliens with no right to be in the country. And what kind of a person would believe my orcas? How can somebody be that stupid? How can somebody who knows that staples, just staples, they're paying 17% more for staples than before Biden was elected. 
How can somebody be so stupid as to know prices have gone up 25%? That oil has, petroleum has gone up from $2 a gallon for gasoline to what it is now. How can anybody be so stupid as to thinking the economy is doing well? Who could possibly be that stupid? A liberal Democrat. How can anybody listen to somebody who's obviously not telling you the truth? Why would you listen to somebody who defends Biden like Whoopi Goldberg or Joe Scarborough singing the praises of Biden like everything's going well? How can you be that stupid? Don't you see what happens when you try to fill your tank with petrol, with gasoline? Don't you see what's happening when you go to the grocery store? Are you really that stupid? Well, you must be if you vote liberal Democrat. You must be that stupid. Jacob, is this a general turning over of people to a spirit of error? I think it is. They've been handed over to their own idiocy for spirit so, reasons, yes. So good is evil, right is wrong, and people... Yep. And admit the treat if they ever see the truth, the the lie they prefer the lie. Of course, they prefer the lie. You know, I know people. I know, I know. I have Roman Catholic family who see what's happening in the Roman Catholic Church with the pedophilia. They prefer to believe the lie. Yeah. They choose the lie. Well, they'll be the victims of it. Yeah. Jacob, let me ask you this. Um, because of what you were saying about the Republican Party, and this is a telltale sign. This is a unit party. It's revealed more than yeah. ever. You have Speaker Johnson, who just passed this, this foreign aid package, which overwhelmingly, even if you want to make the case, okay, we need to support Israel and send some money for defense and all that stuff, but overwhelmingly for Ukraine, which has done very little of anything to uh, defend their own country and actually taking a lot of that money for themselves and and corrupt leaders and Zelensky and all that stuff. But he backs it up and says, okay, there's going to give 61 for Ukraine, 29 for Israel, eight for Taiwan, in order to appease the Democrats, he says, because otherwise they wouldn't pass this package. But he has nothing for the border. Nothing. Not one penny goes for the border. He says, Correct. I have no, nothing I have for the border. border. That is an outrage in itself. Now, I respectfully disagree as much as I dislike Zelensky and the Ukrainian government. The Ukrainian people have suffered terribly and fought bravely. I don't think that they've done nothing. It's not the people. It's my, my problems with the regime. Oh, absolutely. The, the, yeah. the people are yeah. not seeing any of this money. Ukrainian they have seen people, nothing of this money. Ukrainian people have fought bravely and paid a terrible price. Um, so I wouldn't quite be able to echo your sentiments as you've expressed them, but no I problem. I have no regard for Zelensky and his regime. That the Ukrainian government was corrupt before this war began. They were in bed with Biden. How could they be anything else? However, having said that, because he is a professing born-again Christian, I feel that I have been not simply betrayed, Mr. Johnson is a, Mike Johnson is a political Judas. His number one infraction to support without FISA warrants, government surveillance on American citizens without a court order and without any evidence being persuaded objectively to a court. The man has acted against the constitution. He's acted against democracy. Believer or no believer, Proverbs tells me three times, an unjust balance is an abomination to the Lord. I consider that man to be an enemy of the Constitution and an enemy of freedom. And once the Constitution is no longer being upheld, it will no longer protect the right of Christians. Mr. Johnson is a political Judas. I would say that I, as high as my hopes were for him initially, I no longer trust or respect him at all. I really do not. I cannot. And the fact that he is a believer or professes to be makes it much, much worse. He's as bad as the rest of them. A politician is a politician. Godless scum. That's what they behave like. Godless scum. And Mr. Johnson, you say you're a Christian, but you behave like godless scum. On top of that, Jacob, the Congress passed in this FISA bill 
where they can spy on us, they exempted the FBI from spying on Congress. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yep. Hypocrites. Is, uh, hypocrites. Hypocrites. Total hypocrites. Yeah, this is oh, FISA 702 that passed last week uh, on April 12th. This is FISA 702, which Jacob's only words. I mean, you're talking about it, but it's it, the details are even more like infuriating. It was a tie. Conservative Republican said who no. Who broke the tie? Mike Johnson. And are, are those laws going to be used against Christians when the FBI said they're going to spy on Christian parents? That 100%. man is a Judas. Johnson is a Judas. Yeah. He's a politician first and a Christian second. That's right. That's that's what Mike Johnson is. That's what he's always been. It's unfortunate, but most politicians are exactly that. Yeah. All they do is they spin you the yarn that you need to hear for that moment to get elected. Yeah. And once they get in, they forget their Bible. They forget their brothers. They forget their sisters. They forget their church association. It's all about power. I understand yeah. he has a narrow majority and he's in a politically difficult situation. But the compromise on democratic freedom, when federal surveillance is being used against Christians for being Christians, upholding Christian morality, not wanting their children indoctrinated, and you break the vote and you give them the power. At the That's same right. time, the Thank federal you. government is, the White House is going to Google and to all of these Silicon Valley social networks and, and social media and, and saying, do this, do that. Active collaboration between media and social media and a corrupt government. And Johnson takes their size. James yeah. is right. He's a politician first and a Christian second. You know what somebody who says who's a politician first and a Christian second is? A whore with a cross around his neck. Yeah. You can well, put a chain with a cross on it around your neck, but you're still a whore. Think of a prostitute on the street corner wearing a cross around her neck, turning tricks. That's what a politician is who says that they are, who proves with their actions, who says with their actions that they are a politician first and a Christian second. Well, that's what Johnson is. Let me let me break it down so that people can really understand. This is about as big as Obama turning the internet to the UN. Uh, yeah. speaking, they literally the, the the government will take over the internet in the United States with yep. massive expansion of surveillance. Your text messages, your emails, your internet provide anything you can think of. You go to a coffee shop, you go to a, a you know laundry mat, you can go to anywhere, and they have to hand over that data. Uh, according to the NSA, and they passed it. it. They go to Google, they go to Verizon, they go to anybody now that provides a Wi-Fi service, whether it's through routers, whether it's through just Wi-Fi signals, and it's the most dramatic expansion that the government has ever, we have ever seen the government do. And this was done at the hand of a Republican who claims to be a Christian. Yes, This, yep. this is self-described conservative, he says. Yes, you know. And they say they that it wasn't used that much, but it was four hundred thousand times <laughs> under the last uh, <laughs> renewal. Not that much, only four hundred thousand. You know what There's reminds me? Jesse Helms was a big born again Christian, and he was on the the, the the Senate committee responsible for tobacco subsidies when his wife's family was some of the biggest tobacco farmers in the country, and he was on the committee that oversaw it making the taxpayers subsidize the tobacco industry, giving people cancer and emphysema. And w when he was challenged about this, he said he would pray about it. <laughs> you've, always had, you've always had people like Johnson. Jesse Helms was one of them with the tobacco. Yeah. Go ahead, David. Go ahead. Ed Cruz said years ago, I think it was before his last election, he wrote that book, and in the book, he said, most people are pretty naive about their own politician. They all talk conservative before the election, he says, but when they come to Washington and the door is shut, they all vote very liberal. Yeah, And this has been going on for a long time. People think it's uh, it, we're divided into Republican and Democrat, you yeah. know, like we're the the, like party. If you choose Republican, that's good. If you choose a Democrat, it's bad. They're pitting Americans against each other. When that's most right. people in America, I truly believe most people in America do want 
they want to live a decent life. They would like to have law and order. They would like to have, you know, peace in their lives and, and some be, to be able to afford, you know, a home. They, they, we have common beliefs on both sides, but the government is pitting us against each other. Yeah. It tells you something, uh, what Mike Johnson did, because th this is who is very happy about this. You know who's very happy? Chuck Schumer. Totally loves, totally loves what Mike Johnson did. Uh, Joe Biden just says he, he's an effective speaker, he says. He's an effective. So when you got those guys telling you that they did a great job, you did a great job. I, I don't know. You got to look at yourself in the mirror and say, what have I done? And this is the, you know, and, and then, of course, some Republicans are saying this is good. Obviously, quite a bit of them, the conservative ones are not saying, are not saying that at all. But Massey and, and Chip Roy and all these guys are saying the Internet has been handed over. The internet has been handed over to uh, basically our spying agencies. So, so this is where we are. This is where we are today. And uh, boy, we got to really think about that. Most politicians, when they go to, the, you know, they leave their state and they go to Washington, most of them become bad, but a few of them actually hold the ground and they actually get better. And that would be uh, Johnson the way he's he's grilling everybody and exposing the truth. You talked about Chip Roy. There's a few. There's a handful right. of good, good men. Yeah, but we need a, we need two hundred more. <laughs> That's right. That's right. I, I, one one final part, and this is our last subject for catching up. And we will be going to backstage to take questions. So if you guys are watching and you're watching live, you serve some explosive stuff today. Not only about Israel, what's going on here in America, what's going on in Australia, in the UK, all these pointing to the fact that, look, persecution is coming, perseverance to tribulation. What Paul talked about is something we have to exercise as Christians in the world because uh, the world's no friend of Christians and there's many betrayers, many false teachers, and uh, we have to stick together as believers. We have to really stick to God's word, hold on to it, glued on to it, and to each other. To go through these difficult times, I want to I want to bring this last point up, which is the Stronger Man's Conference, which is in Missouri this week, and they do it every year, and it's been going on for some time. And uh, at a time where Christians ought to be outspoken about their faith and the gospel, and they need for repentance and salvation only in Jesus Christ, and bringing back salt and light to a society that has certainly lost its way. And, and to David's point, there are still some people that see it that want that, and the church should be the most the most outspoken and advocating truth, reality, salvation, repentance, faith, um, you get this conference. Mark Driscoll, which we have talked about here long, you know, many times, he's a false teacher, was a feature speaker. What they had at this conference was the, the, the performance of a guy named Alex Magala, which is like a, a male stripper, swallowing swords and dancing on a pole with his shirt off, and the crowd going wild. Men, Christian men, supposed to be applauding this man, Mark Driscoll gets on the stage after the performance and he protests against it. And he says, this was wrong. This was sinful. This was like the Jezebel spirit and all this stuff. And he gets kicked off the stage by the pastor who is, uh, I suppose, the, the leader of this organization, uh, Stronger Man's Conference, John Lindell. And uh, he invites back, like he kicked Mark, uh, uh, Driscoll out. He invites him back. And Driscoll apologizes for what he did because he said, yeah, I should have done it privately, Matthew 18. I should not have done it openly, you know, calling out the sin of having a, a male stripper at a man's conference. And uh, and so they go back together and they talk. And, and Lindell says, if you come against Mark Driscoll, you're coming against the anointing of a man. And you're, to a lesser extent, you're coming against God. You're coming against uh, the faith. And you're going to wander from the faith. And more or less, you're going to end up in hell because it's unbelief. If you come against Driscoll, if you if you criticize him, and he calls him John the Baptist, and men yeah. clap and cheer, stand innovation at this false teaching, and these it, are, it breaks our hearts. Jacob, I'll turn it over to you. And these, this includes men who are pastors who should know better. Yeah, yeah. The Many fact that you'd have somebody like a vulgar person like Driscoll, who is ethically rejected. Even by Mars Church, they rejected him on ethical grounds. I yes. mean, this guy is a, you know, he, he had people go out buy copies of his book to artificially get it on the New York Times bestseller list, and he got caught doing it. I mean, he's, he's ethically deficient, but his mouth is extremely vulgar. Uh, 
I, his teaching on the Song of Solomon was was not only bad doctrinally, but just the way he talks is disgusting. Um, yeah. To have somebody like him. Well, look what they've got. They've got this guy doing this stuff. How does this teach men to be Christ-like? What? what? It, it, it's worse than Promise Keepers. Promise yeah. Keepers was a stupid joke. Was a stupid ecumenical joke and a con job. Okay, this is worse than promise keepers. Mm. Yep. Well, you it's know, supposed to been... take on that form. It's supposed to take on that form of man's conference, like promise keepers, to you know, stronger man. Go ahead, David. Yeah. Driscoll was had forty elders. Forty of his elders say he was unfit for service. There was. $202,000 missing. That was attested to by the elders. Then there was 21 of his elders called him an abusive pastor. So look, he is the qualifications for being a pastor is above reproach. And so he shouldn't even be at these conferences. But then once you start calling him out, they, they use the same ploy that Benny, Kenny, Joyce, all those people did to Jacob and me 35 years ago. Touch not my anointed. Touch not my anointed. They did it, this guy calling him John, uh, John the Baptist. You know, and so I had one person call me out and say, hey, those elders didn't turn out very good. So I just replied. So now you're telling me that his discernment wasn't good enough to pick good godly men? It, you know, it just gets, it goes from bad to worse. And this conference, you know, it was just a, it looked like a giant entertainment. The thing that Spurgeon warned about a hundred plus years ago. Oh, Entertaining God. goats. Yeah. And, and <laughs> And there's, you know, and their messages are not, they're not, it's, they're just, it's, it's hype. It's, it's emotion. They're getting men to grow on emotion. And David, yeah. they, they, this was a sexualized event. It, it, it's, yeah. it's bad enough, bad teaching, no teaching, hype. That's all they did. But now you invite a sexually perverted act into a man's conference. And most men stayed. It wasn't even a huge protest about it or anything. So I, I don't understand, you know, going back to our first point about the uh, gay Christianity, have uh, people just, you know, pastors and leaders turn a blind eye to it. They just like, well, you know, we just let it be. We have to look into it. Now this conference has something perverted and they're okay with it. And even when a false teacher says, hey, you know what? Maybe for a moment, his conscience was pricked that this was wrong. But then to come back and say, I apologize for doing it that way and, and calling out the sin. I should have done it in Matthew 18, which, again, is one of those most misunderstood verses by any any Christian that doesn't even know how to apply them. Yep. But this is it, it is so beyond ridiculous. It is yep. so beyond ridiculous. And David, to so people to criticize you for telling them this was wrong is also yeah. ridiculous. Uh, yeah. You know, just backing up a false teacher for doing something that he should have not have been in the first place. But uh, it is ridiculous. This is the Christian church. This is what salt and light was supposed to be in our world. I don't know. I don't know if there's any left. Doctrine, doctrine has not been taught. People do not know what they believe and why they believe anymore, Marco. They don't know their Bible. You know, you talk to people now that it's, like when I get around good, solid Christians that love the Lord and love the word of God comes out of their mouth. The truth is that they see you see their life ruled by by the word and guided by it. But when you get around worldly Christians, all of a sudden you hear no doctrine. You don't hear mm. anything or you get a misapplication of doctrine. There's yes. there's error coming out of their hearts you know there was a study just released this week elizabeth sent it out it was uh <clears throat> bible engagement and the numbers of christians or people who engage with the bible <laughs> has decreased by 40 percent since 2011 wow wow i yeah, mean yeah. people who read the bible at least three times a month has gone down by 40% since 2011. Wow. Jay? 
problems that we're having in Jamaica that I've been told by the pastors here is that um, the women are coming to the pulpit and being pastors because the men yep. have completely shirked their responsibility to be men of God. This um, uh, conference that we watched with Mark Driscoll is a symptom of a bigger problem. These men, by their standard, they would be wagging their fingers at John the Baptist. Yes. Saying, you know what? You should be going to these Pharisees in private. You shouldn't call them serpents in front of everyone and shame them. They would wag their fingers at Elijah. How yep. dare you not understand that they have a different belief system than you, Elijah? They have no idea what it is when it when people are trying to call for repentance, what that means. That that's the that's the call of men of God who have courage. But there's so many men that don't have any courage left to speak for the truth, speak yeah. for yeah. doctrine. Yeah. Oh, yeah. how dare you judge? Quit judging. Isn't that <laughs> judge. Go ahead, Davy. You got some, Davy. Oh, well, actually, when you were just talking to Jay, you just reminded me something, and it was an image I already had in my head, but I'll, I'll say it now, too. What it did actually remind me of was the Hillsong Conference, the women's conference that time yes, where they yeah. had the naked cowboy. Oh, so yeah. Kind of like yes. the, the male equivalent. But even the whole the whole Mark Driscoll's, what do you call it, um, indign indignation and then the so-called apology and all the rest of it, to me, it all looked uh, just as staged as the rest of the show. You know, you had the tanks, you had the pyrotechnic techniques. It's it just looked like one big theatrical event. And uh, yep. yeah, yeah, exactly, Mister Spurgeon's prophecy coming true. Instead yeah. of sheep, it, instead of shepherds feeding the sheep, we're going to have crowns entertaining the goats. Yeah. yeah. If anybody, if anyone was like Driscoll, like, he spent what was it? Something like eleven thousand dollars, wasn't it, out of church funds to. Yep. But he's hooked book. up on the bestseller list. Yep. If he's yep. going to do that. He'll stoop to stoop to any tactic. Yep. Well, what they're saying is as much as two hundred thousand dollars was misappropriated. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, and I just wanted to mention a comment too that somebody uh, posted in the Rumble chat, which um, I definitely want to check out too. They basically they they've uh, told us that Jack Hibbs did a video this week saying that Mike Johnson is doing God's will. Whoa. Mike Johnson. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaker Mike Johnson. Yeah, Franklin Graham said the same thing that he likes them. No, uh, yeah, th this is this is um, yeah, crazy stuff. But uh, and another just just to finish off, Jacob, the uh, the IHOP KC in Kansas City is yeah. uh, is closing down. They're becoming a mission organization now. I don't know what that even means uh, because of all the scandals and all the problems with they Mike Pickle. In order to live in lawsuits for sexual predatory actions of the leadership they don't yep. want to do so they're closing it down and making it a non-entity and reinventing itself and redefining itself and rebranding itself for legal purposes another well, sexual issue another sexual they're, issue oh, yep they're yep. turning this over is... the money to the next organization they can just run it yep. on out yeah scandal hemorrhaging five hundred thousand a month hemorrhaging five hundred thousand a month unbelievable and, and this is why, you know, it's, it's such an outrage. I think Christians have such an outrage of what's going on within Christianity, within the church, whether it's the false church or not, it, it, under the name of Christ. And yeah. uh, when persecution starts, and you've seen it, you've seen the video, you see over and over, we try to tell everybody about this. Uh, the church becomes now uh, sexual predators and, yeah. uh, and moral and, and now discussing about gay theology and all this stuff and and. The closer we get to the return of Jesus and what's going on, you could see how apostasy is setting in. And my dear friends, apostasy, what the Bible speaks about apostasy, it's 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 a lot more than what you and I think. It's 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 a powerful thing, and it's gonna get into your church if you if you let it happen, it's gonna get into your church, it's gonna get into your family, it's gonna get into pastors, it's gonna get into leaders, and God forbid it gets into your heart. But we need to pray, we need to seek God's word and seek God's face, we need to uh, seek each other fellowship and continue on in God's word and being faithful to it and obedient to it, because we're, we are going to be in the in that situation where Paul speaks about that the apostasy comes first. And it's already happening to a large extent among the evangelical churches, which, again, the the the, the, the government 
actually says it out loud that evangelicals, these call them whatever, political Christians or or right wing Christians or whatever they call it, are the hurdle or the the obstacle, I should say, yes. uh, to their agenda, to their agenda. So the church, instead of being salt and light and proclaiming the gospel and Jesus returning, it's actually getting into gay theology, strip clubs, and promoting false teachers. Um, my God. God. And false prophecy, like the uh, stupid eclipse being a yeah. harbinger of yeah. doom. Yeah. I mean, blood moons. And th 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 every time there's something natural happen, they think it's supernatural. They're, yeah, everything but the word. Everything yeah, and but the word of God. The word yeah, of God. They're discredit Christianity, that's why. And they're promoted yeah. because they do discredit Christianity yeah. when they yeah. say ridiculous things like the eclipse is somehow related to the Bible. Yeah, it's, 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 um, that's why we should be outraged, but we also need to make sure that we, you know, continue on in the faith and encourage people, get them Bible studies, get into fellowship, yes. get, and, and get into God's word. Go you go hear Jacob. If you're in Jamaica, go hear Jay. And if you're in the Philippines and Thailand and all of that area, go hear David and in Australia. We're waiting for Jacob to come. We've got good fellowships there here in Southern California as well. And, and that's the real solution. It's it's the, it's, it's Hold the Holy on. Spirit. Hold yeah. And what did Paul say? He says, uh, you know, you have to have brotherly love. Yes. You have to have brotherly love. You have to cling to what is good and abhor evil. That, that's yes. that's the truth of a Christian is to abhor yes. evil, to love the truth, to love each other, but definitely hold on to it and to yes. abhor evil. Yeah. Yes. So it's we're going to be going to. Yeah, go ahead, Jacob. Looming, Marco. Sorry to interrupt. With persecution looming, the things we see happening in the juridical and political sphere are being demonically or even satanically orchestrated to be used eventually against saved Christians. Hmm. The whole January 6th fiasco and the, the corruption and holding people without bail by, by liberal left-wing radical judges and prosecutors, the, the corruption is unbelievable. Right-wing, um, Bush yeah. appointees and Reagan appointees. Yes, Reagan, yes. Yes, I always said Reagan was no good in the judges he appointed. But anyway, um, Sandra Day, O'Connor, etc. But be that as it may, I usually agree with Tucker Carlson, but sometimes I don't. But he did an excellent interview this week with a journalist called Julie Kelly. Um, she has done the most extensive investigative journalism on January 6th. You can see it on the internet. And I would suggest people listen to the interview with Julie Kelly. If anyone doubts that democracy is the thing of the past, listen to that interview. These laws go. are going to be used against Christians. Or yes, just no. lawlessness, lawlessness is going to be used against Christians. Jesus said, he's going to put you before judges and before no. kings. And don't worry about what you said, because I'll give it to you in that hour, and it will be of the Holy Spirit. You know, so he tells us these things in advance so that we might know he is God and we have a strong foundation. And if you hold on to him, the worst thing this world can do is send us to eternity a little bit earlier. Yep. I guess, Jacob, the whole point that we're waiting for this 2024 election to, to take back our country and Christians are going to supporting this and we're going to be back to Christianity in this whole aspect of, you know, post-millennialism, we're going to triumph over this. Um, I, I guess we're not going to wait for the 2024 election because even Republicans now, even the ones yes. we think are going to be voting for them to get us out of this mess are the yes. ones putting us in. Even if Donald Trump wins, and I don't think it's certain at this point that he will, because of corruption and so forth. And I don't think God's hand is on him again anymore because of some of the compromises he's made. Yep. But even if he wins, don't put your hope on, on, on any government or politician. Pray for them. And obviously, I don't want Biden or anybody like this to be reelected. But it is, it is possible that neither Biden nor Trump will actually be the next president. That is possible. Mm. Or to even have an election. Yeah, because yeah, because of the politically motivated prosecutions of Trump, which are outrageous, and because of the senility of Biden, it may be it's not unthinkable that neither one of them will be the next president. Yep, yep, absolutely right. All right. Well, let's go to backstage. We got some questions. 
Join us on backstage. We're not going to be on YouTube or Facebook. We're going to jump right into Rumble. We're taking questions on Rumble, and we're going to take some questions for Jacob Prash. And um, you're watching Catching Up. We'll see you in just a few minutes. So jump over to the other side, too, backstage, and uh, you'll hear some of the questions there. So we got some good questions today. So uh, God bless you guys. We'll see you in a few minutes.